All right, here we are at the fifth and final lecture of the urinary system. Let's get rolling with our not really attendance questions. Where does penicillin first appear in the filtrate? How do kidneys increase blood calcium? And how does ANG2 increase blood pressure? Go ahead and pause your video and try to answer those. And let's see what the correct answer should be. Where does penicillin first appear in the filtrate? Well, penicillin is one of the drugs that is going to be carried bound to plasma proteins. And remember, plasma proteins are not filtered at the glomerulus. They are too large to be filtered. So anything that's attached to those plasma proteins will also not be filtered. Instead, what happens is they will be secreted at the PCT. So penicillin is going to first appear in the filtrate in the proximal convoluted tubule, the PCT. How do kidneys increase blood calcium? Well, they do it a couple of ways. We previously mentioned how uh, the kidneys activate vitamin D, and vitamin D is needed to absorb calcium from your diet. So that's one way. And the other way is that in response to PTH, parathyroid hormone, the kidneys are going to reabsorb calcium at the distal convoluted tubule. That's the other way. How does ANG2, angiotensin 2, increase blood pressure? It does it two ways. All right, remember in the renin angiotensin mechanism, ANG2, the most potent vasoconstrictor in the body, so it causes vasoconstriction, increasing peripheral resistance, which increases blood pressure. And it also tells the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. And aldosterone causes increased sodium reabsorption, which leads to increased water reabsorption, and then that whole pathway, which ultimately ends with increased cardiac output, which increases blood pressure. So, ANG2 increases blood pressure two ways. Hopefully, that's something that's really solidified in your mind now, because we've covered it a couple of times by this point. All right, so let's get back to our lecture. So... Uh, first, before I actually begin lecturing, I'm sorry if there's noise. I'm sitting in a very creaky chair tonight, so every time I move, even in the slightest, it creaks. Um, but I want to, before we introduce new stuff, there was an error that I pointed out at the end of our last lecture when we were talking about how does ANP uh, affect the kidneys. Um, and we said that a and P dilates the afferent arteriole, which it does. It dilates all of your blood vessels that have smooth muscle. Um, but in the original introduction of this, we said that it decreases NFP and GFR, but it doesn't. It increases NFP, GFR. So it is in effect um, causing a decrease in blood volume because it is causing uh, more liquid to be filtered out of your blood. So it's going to lower your blood pressure that way. Later today, um, we're going to see another way that ANP affects blood volume, blood pressure with regards to the vasorecta. So yesterday, or well, last time we had this lecture, we said dilates afferent arteriole, and incorrectly we said it decreases NFP GFR. The way that you see it on this slide is correct. And I mentioned it, but I didn't change it on the slide last time. It should raise NFP and raise GFR, which ultimately lowers blood volume. So let's pick up where we left off. Now, several times we have talked about ADH and what does it do at the kidneys. Um, each time we've mentioned it throughout the semester, we've been a little bit more specific. Here is where we've stood for the last few lectures. 
ADH tells the cells in your late nephron, so in the DCT and in the collecting duct, um, to make aquaporin type 2. Those cells uh, then begin to synthesize aquaporin type 2s when they're inserted into the membranes of the cells. It causes us to reabsorb more water from the filtrate. Ultimately, that produces very concentrated urine. Your urine volume goes down and the specific gravity or the concentration of the urine goes up because we've pulled a lot of water out of it. That water ultimately goes back into our bloodstream. So ADH ultimately causes an increase in blood volume and a decrease in plasma osmolarity. But now we're going to look at how do our kidneys really, really maximize the amount of water that is being reabsorbed. And your kidneys really, really do reabsorb practically all of the water from the filtrate before it gets to the end of the collecting duct. And what we're going to be drawing here in just a little bit is presented on page 906 and 907 of your textbook. Uh, it's a little confusing, I think, the way your textbook presents it. So um, we're going to draw it out on the whiteboard here. And I suggest that you draw along. It'll make it make a little more sense, I think. But what we're going to be doing is drawing something called the countercurrent mechanism. And the countercurrent mechanism is a way that our loop of Henle and Vasa recta can work together to really maximize the amount of water that's being reabsorbed and for the most part, expending no ATP. Now, when we get to the end of the loop of Henle, uh, at the thick part of the ascending limb, there is going to be some ATP uh, consumed, but not very much. Most of the process that we're gonna draw is passive, and we'll see how it can be passive and still reabsorb a lot of water. But before we draw this out, I want to talk about what the countercurrent mechanism is, and then I want to talk about how uh, loop of Henle kind of works in different types of nephrons and in different types of animals. So the two parts of the countercurrent mechanism are something called the countercurrent multiplier, which is the activity of the loop of Henle, how the descending limb and the ascending limb work together to maximize water reabsorption, and the countercurrent exchanger, how the vasa recta works to maximize the amount of water that's moving back into our bloodstream. So remember, we said that all along the nephron, it's surrounded by either paratubular capillaries or vasa recta, each of which is a type of capillary but there's some space, some interstitium in between the nephron and this capillary. So when we reabsorb something, it actually goes from the filtrate out into the interstitium and from the interstitium into the capillary to be carried away. Now, what we see here is uh, a couple of loops of Henle in two different types of animals. Over here we see the rabbit, which is very similar to a human. Over here we see a kangaroo rat, which we see has a very long loop of Henle. Now before we talk about why this difference in structure uh, exists, I want to talk about the two different types of nephrons. So we've mentioned now uh, a few times something called the cortical nephron and the juxtamedullary nephron. Now, somewhere in the vicinity of like 80% of our nephrons are cortical nephrons. And cortical nephrons have very short loops of Henle. Now, the longer the loop of Henle, the longer and the deeper it goes into the medulla of the kidney. So cortical nephrons are almost entirely within the cortex. And that's what this dotted line represents. Above the dotted line is the cortex of the kidney. So in the cortex, that's where we find the renal corpuscle, 
all of the PCTs and all of the DCTs and most of the loops of Henle. In the cortical nephrons, only a little bit of the loop of Henle extends into the medulla. And again, like I said, that's about 80% of our nephrons have this layout. Now, juxtamedullary nephrons, the loops of Henle are much longer. They go deeper into the medulla. Now, this is going to be really important because if you look at those diagrams on page 906-907, um, well, I guess it doesn't really make too much sense at this point because we haven't drawn it out, but the deeper we go into the medulla, the greater the osmolarity or concentration of the interstitium. Remember the interstitium, the area outside of cells. So the greater the concentration, the deeper we go into the medulla. If we have a short loop of Henle, it doesn't go very deep into the medulla. If we have a very long loop of Henle, it goes deeper into the medulla. So long loops of Henle go deeper into the medulla, which means it goes to an area of the medulla where there is greater concentration or greater osmolarity in the interstitium. That's going to be really important. And when we draw it out here in just a moment, we'll reiterate that. So if you didn't completely grasp that just by me saying it, you'll see it drawn out here in just a moment. Now, rabbits, like humans, tend to live, you know, in places where there's not an overabundance of water, but there's easy access to water. So there's not really a lot of worry that we might go without. Anytime we're thirsty, we can get easy access to water. But now over here on the right, we can see that these kangaroo rats have extremely long loops of Henle, much longer even than our loops of Henle. So even in our juxtamedullary nephrons, the ones that have the really long loops of Henle, the kangaroo rats are even longer when, with regards to loops of Henle. So they go even deeper into the medulla. Now, kangaroo rats live in the desert. So there is a real good chance that it's going to be a really long time in between one drink and the next for them. They don't know where their next drink is going to come from. So they have these really long loops of Henle. And this is going to really maximize water reabsorption for them. So keep that in mind. We will come back to it after we do our drawing. So let's look to see what it is here that we've drawn. I'll give you all a chance to kind of draw this out while I'm explaining it. Feel free to please pause the recording and draw this if you don't want to listen to me talk while you're drawing. But let me talk about what I've drawn here. This is that generic nephron that we've seen several times now, and we've said that it's drawn this way so that we can easily indicate different parts of it. And I'm going to take advantage of that now. So the black thing is a nephron. Over here, this round part, this is Bowman's capsule that has the glomerulus inside. Then we have our proximal convoluted tubule, PCT. We have our descending loop of Henle ascending loop of Henle, the DCT, and the collecting duct. Now, this could be any nephron, but we're going to talk about the juxtamedullary nephrons, because even though they only make up about 20% of our nephrons, they are responsible for most of our water conservation. So, outside of the PCT, most of the water that's reabsorbed is in the loop of Henle, especially in those juxtamedullary nephrons, the ones with the really long loops of Henle. So what I've drawn in this kind of greenish brown uh, color here, this is the osmolarity of the interstitium. So higher up on the screen, this is the cortex. The lower down we go on the screen, it's going deeper and deeper and deeper into the medulla. And 
at its deepest point, juxtamedullary nephrons go so deep into the medulla that they get to about 1,200. And this is in milliosmoles. So let me go ahead and put that unit on here in a few spots. Milliosmoles. So 300 milliosmoles up in the cortex, 1,200 milliosmoles at its deepest point. So the, the, the higher the number, the greater the osmolarity or the greater the concentration of the interstitium. Now, for reference, in the adequately hydrated person, so in the average healthy adult male, the osmolarity of blood plasma is also 300 milliosmoles. So with all of the electrolytes and everything that's in blood plasma, we get an osmolarity of about 300 milliosmoles. Now, what we're going to do as we draw this out together, we're going to look at what's happening at each step in each location along the nephron. And we're going to look at the effects of water reabsorption and solute reabsorption and what does it do to the osmolarity of the filtrate. So let's look to see when we first filter the blood, the osmolarity of the filtrate inside Bowman's capsule is also 300 milliosmoles because it is practically the exact same thing as plasma. It has some differences, but it's practically the exact same thing as plasma. Now, as we move through the proximal convoluted tubule, the PCT, we are reabsorbing water, but we're also reabsorbing solutes. So as we move through the PCT, and when we get to the end of the PCT, the osmolarity of the filtrate is still about 300 milliosmoles. Now it's reduced in volume quite a bit, but the concentration doesn't really change all that much because we have reabsorbed water and we have reabsorbed solutes. But we get to the end of the PCT and then we take a turn and now we're going to start leaving the renal cortex and go down into the renal medulla. And here it's important to think about the anatomy of each side of the loop of Henle. What are they permeable to? So as this filtrate travels down, we get to a point, and granted I've written 300, 600, 900, 1200, it is not neatly broken up that way. It is simply a gradient. The deeper you go, it just keeps increasing. So I'm doing it in very broad steps here. We get to a point where the way I've written it, it's 300 milliosmoles inside the loop and 600 milliosmoles outside the loop. So there is a big difference in concentration. There are more solutes outside than inside because of the concentration. And what is the loop of Henle permeable to on the descending side? Think back to our last lecture. It's permeable to water and nothing else. So even though there are more solutes out in the interstitium, there is actually, you know, the want for those solutes to come in, but they can't because the loop of Henle on the descending side is not permeable to solutes. The other thing that could potentially happen, and it is what happens, is those solutes out in the interstitium, they suck water towards themselves. So as we go down the loop of Henle, water is being reabsorbed. Water moves out of the loop of Henle into the interstitium, ultimately into the vasorecta to be carried away. How much water moves out? Well, until they are equal. So I'm going to write a 600 here. We keep reabsorbing water until it's the same inside and outside. And that 600 continues down. Now we see here it's 600 inside, 900 outside. 
Again, the solutes want to come in from high concentration to low concentration, but they can't. It's not permeable to any of those solutes. Instead, those solutes suck water out. We've reabsorbed some more water. How much? Well, until the concentration is equal. And again, that filtrate keeps moving through. We get to a point where there's 900 inside, 1200 outside, and those solutes suck water out. So the entire descending limb of the loop of Henle, as that filtrate is going down the loop of Henle, we are just continually pulling water out of the nephron into the interstitium until we get to the bottom. And now the osmolarity of the filtrate is 1200 milliosmoles, much more concentrated than it was in the beginning. That 1200 milliosmoles means we have reabsorbed a lot of water. Pardon me while I take a drink. I'm sorry if this is loud. So that leads to a couple of problems. One, every time water is reabsorbed, it goes out here into the interstitium. And if we keep adding water to the interstitium, what's that going to do to the interstitium? It's going to dilute it until eventually the osmolarity of the interstitium is going to be 300 all the way down, even into the deepest points in the medulla. Once we are at 300 all the way down, the problem that we run into is now there is no more pulling force. There's no more way for us to reabsorb all this water and we would quickly dehydrate because all of, well, I'm sorry for that, um, all of the water would just remain in the filtrate as we pass through the rest of the nephron. Let me re erase that real quick. All of the water would remain and we would just urinate a lot and all the water would just pass straight through us. So there must be a way to keep this osmolarity constant in the interstitium. Well, there is a way to do that. Let's think, as we come back up, on the ascending side, what is it permeable to? It's permeable to solutes. Now, down low in the thin segment, it's permeable to sodium and chloride, and it's passive. Up at the top, it's permeable to sodium, chloride, and potassium, and it's active. We won't really talk too much about that. We will mention it here in just a moment. But we're permeable to solutes. So we get up to this point where it's 1,200 inside and 900 outside. Well, it could try to suck the water in, but we're not permeable to water on this side. What's the alternative? Everything wants to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So those solutes, the sodium and the chloride, are going to get sucked out. We're right. Solutes, S-O-L. And how many solutes are going to get sucked out or are going to move out down their concentration gradient is more appropriate to say. Well, until we reach equilibrium. And as that filtrate moves, again, more solutes move out down their concentration gradient. Until eventually we get to the upper part where we actually expend a little bit of energy and even more solutes come out. We have to spend a little bit of ATP for that. By the time we get to the top, we're actually even less than we started with as far as osmolarity goes. We're down to about 100 milliosmoles. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's go back and look to see what the point of all of this is. Well, over here on the water side, every time we reabsorbed water, we diluted the interstitium. But over here, every time solutes moved out down their concentration gradient, it reestablished this osmolarity. 
So as the solutes move out, it maintains at this point, let's say 900. But if this remains 900, that pulls more water out, diluting it. And if we dilute it, that creates the gradient for more solutes to come out. So all over on the descending side, water is getting sucked out because of this concentration gradient. Over here, solutes are moving down their concentration gradient because water keeps diluting it. But water keeps diluting it because the solutes keep reestablishing it. The descending side drives the events of the ascending side. And the ascending side drives the events of the descending side. This is that counter current mechanism that we were talking about, or at least the first half of it. Everything on the descending side causes the ascending side to happen. And everything on the ascending side in turn causes everything on the descending side to happen. And it doesn't require any energy. The only energy that we use is at the very top of the ascending limb. And that's just where we overshoot and we get down to about 100 milliosmoles. So now that filtrate moves through the descending limb and down the collecting duct. But let's see what happens when we need to reabsorb even more water. Let's see what happens when aldosterone and ADH are present. Well, aldosterone tells the DCT to reabsorb more sodium solutes. So what happens when we reabsorb more solutes? It increases this osmolarity of the interstitium. What happens if we increase the osmolarity of the interstitium? More water will get reabsorbed. And at the same time that we have ADH causing this in the DCT, I'm sorry, aldosterone causing this in the DCT, we also have ADH adding in those aquaporins in the collecting duct. That allows water to be reabsorbed. So we've maximized water reabsorption. But that's not all. There's even more to the story because we also reabsorb urea. We always reabsorb urea in the collecting duct, but in the presence of ADH, we reabsorb more. Why the heck would we reabsorb urea? Well, what is urea? It's a solute. As urea comes out, if ADH is present, we pull even more water out along with it because it's a solute and solutes suck. As urea comes out and now it's in the interstitium, what does it do? It increases the osmolarity or the concentration of the interstitium, which pulls more water out of the loop of Henle. But urea doesn't stay out here in the interstitium. It is immediately secreted into the loop of Henle. Your book shows it happen over on this side. Really, it happens on both sides, more on the ascending side, but that's not important. Urea is being reabsorbed from the collecting duct where it pulled water with it. Urea is immediately secreted into the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. What happens when urea moves into the ascending limb of the loop of Henle? It increases the concentration of the filtrate. What happens if you increase the concentration of the filtrate? Well, that is then going to cause more solutes, sodium and chloride, to move out into the interstitium. When we move more sodium and chloride out into the interstitium, what does that do? It pulls even more water out. So everything that we've drawn is all about maximizing water reabsorption in any way possible. But this is only part of the story. We're going to add even more to it. I encourage you to listen to everything that we see on this whiteboard over and over and over because there's going to be a lot of stuff that, that you could miss if you just listen one time. So let's see what else is going on. Well, 
when we reabsorb that water, we don't want it to just kind of hang around here in the interstitial. In reality, and I apologize that this is about to get really messy, we actually have that specialized capillary, the vasorecta, that formed almost a ladder all around this loop of Henle. And when water is reabsorbed, it's passed into the vasorecta to be carried away. Some solutes also pass in to be carried away. But we do not just leave the water to hang out there in the interstitium. It goes into the interstitium, into the vasorecta to be carried away. When the vasorecta carries that water away, and just a few of the solutes, not many, it keeps this concentration elevated, which allows more water to be reabsorbed in the descending limb. And when that water is reabsorbed in the descending limb, where does it go? Into the vasorecta to be carried away, maximizing water reabsorption. Okay, take a moment, take a breather, pause the recording because we're going to keep this same drawing, but then we're going to switch gears. Okay, so let's see what happens if we don't really need to maximize water reabsorption. What if our blood pressure is up? If our blood pressure is up, we really don't want to reabsorb a lot of water because that would raise our blood volume, raising our blood pressure even more. Well, previously we mentioned ANP, and we said ANP, in addition to everything that we talked about, it also works on the vasorecta. What does ANP do to the vasorecta? It causes it to become leaky. Fluid from the vasorecta actually spills out, and it spills out into the interstitium. And if we're flooding the interstitium with water, we basically wash away this gradient. And if we wash away that gradient, now there is no mechanism to pull water out. So we stop reabsorbing as much water. More water stays in the filtrate. More water remains in the filtrate and more water leaves in the urine. So this whole setup can be used to maximize water reabsorption. It can even go higher in the presence of aldosterone and ADH, or it can be reduced in the presence of ANP. I know that was a lot of information, and I know that presenting it online in this format is really, really tough. So I encourage you guys, one, to watch this a lot. I also encourage you guys to email me, text me, whatever it takes. If you start emailing and texting and it doesn't seem like it's enough, then I will try to figure out a way to, there, there are means through Blackboard to actually meet face-to-face -face online, uh, or if there's another way that you guys prefer, we can do that. I will see if you guys would prefer to do that. Please let me know, and I'll be happy to do that. Otherwise, I'm just sitting at home, you know, trying to think of, of things that I can do to help make this make sense. But we still have just a little bit to go, so let's go back to our PowerPoint and wrap this up. Back to our kangaroo rat. In a rabbit, such as in a human, we have loops of Henle that go down into the medulla at its deepest point, about 1,200 milliosmoles. Now, in a kangaroo rat, who doesn't know when his next drink of water is going to come, they've got much longer loops of Henle. Their loops of Henle actually go so deep into the medulla that they get to a point where the interstitium is maybe around 2,000 or 2,400. So longer loops of Henle go deeper into the medulla, allowing for even more water reabsorption. And the result is in a kangaroo rat and a few other similar desert mammals, their loops of Henle are so long that they are so good at reabsorbing water their urine actually comes out as little crystals. And 
a lot of times people hear me say crystal urine. They think that I mean crystal clear. That's not what I mean. I mean so much water has been reabsorbed that there are little crystals, like little grains of sand, that are being passed by some of these desert mammals because they have reabsorbed so much water. Okay, so let's move on and talk about some disorders. First, I've mentioned now diabetes mellitus, and I say that's the diabetes that everyone is familiar with. But diabetes is actually a class of disorder. It's not a disorder itself. It's a class of disorder. When we get to endocrine, we're going to talk about these in a lot of depth. For right now, I want to introduce two of the main types of diabetes. One is called diabetes mellitus, and there are two types of diabetes mellitus, type 1 and type 2. These are the ones everyone's familiar with. These are the ones that are concerned with insulin and blood sugar. The one that fewer people are uh, aware of is something called diabetes insipidus. has absolutely nothing to do with insulin or glucose blood sugar. It is completely unrelated. So why are they both diabetes? What diabetes actually is is a disorder where someone is urinating a lot. There are many different types of diabetes. The thing that they all have in common is increased urination. So in diabetes mellitus, the reason that someone is urinating a lot is because they have high blood glucose. That glucose exceeds transport maximum, acts as an osmotic diarrhea, as we already saw. So they urinate a lot and there's glucose in the urine. Now, in diabetes insipidus, it is completely unrelated. In diabetes insipidus, someone is either not making ADH or they are not responding to ADH. What kind of result would that give? If you're not making or you're not responding to ADH, then you're not going to reabsorb as much water and again, you're going to urinate a lot. When you urinate a lot, in this case, your urine volume goes up, but there's not going to be any glucose in it at all. It's actually going to be almost pure water. So diabetes mellitus, lots of urine, but the urine has glucose in it. In diabetes insipidus, lots of urine but there's no glucose in it, it's almost pure water. Now let's look to see how they got their names. Mel, mel is a root word that means honey. And the way that they used to diagnose this, and they still do in some parts of the world, you go to the doctor, you say, doc, I'm peeing a lot. And the doc says, oh, sounds like you might have diabetes. I wonder what type you have. And they would collect a sample, urine sample, and they would dip their finger in it and they would touch it to their tongue. And if it were sweet, like honey, because there is glucose in it, you have diabetes mellitus. On the other hand, if they touch it to their tongue and it doesn't have any taste at all, well, insipid means tasteless, like water. You have diabetes insipidus. And that was how they diagnosed which type of diabetes you had long ago or in some parts of the world still. Two other related disorders, well, related to each other, not related to diabetes directly, chronic renal disease versus renal failure. Now, in both of these, your kidneys are no longer performing as much as they should. In chronic renal disease, well, chronic just means long-term, in chronic renal disease, the GFR is below 60 milliliters per minute for longer than three months. Remember, the normal GFR is 120 to 125 milliliters per minute, so it's about half of its normal rate. In renal failure, or kidney failure, GFR drops below 15 milliliters per minute. 
And when this happens, it leads to something called uremia, which literally means urine in the blood. It does not mean that urine is showing up in your blood. What it means is the parts of your blood that should have been cleansed by your kidneys and left your body in the urine are now remaining in your blood. So when this happens, typically someone is put on hemodialysis or just dialysis is more often what it's called. And dialysis uh, is effectively an artificial kidney. They, they hook it to your body, it draws your blood out, it filters your blood, and then it returns the cleansed blood back to your body. So the hemodialysis machine is really doing the same thing that your kidneys do. If you've ever donated plasma, the plasmapheresis machine is very, very similar. Okay, so we are not doing path of blood anymore. We've, we, we won't be doing any written questions on any exams. So really at this point, there's not a lot of need for you guys to, to learn the path of blood, but I still want to at least introduce it because I, I still think it's very important to, to see the connection between blood and all parts of your body. So with this chapter or this unit, there would have been three possibilities for path of blood on top of everything that we've done so far. And this is path of blood through the kidney. One option is the path of blood if the substance is not filtered. So it passes through the glomerulus and out the efferent arterial without being filtered. And that path is what we see here. It goes from the aorta to the renal artery through those smaller and smaller vessels until we get to the afferent arterial, till we get to the glomerulus. And if it's not filtered, it leads through the efferent arterial through the efferent or through the paratubular capillaries or the vasorecta, and then it leaves the kidney back to the vena cava. That would have been one option. Another option is path of blood if the substance is filtered at the glomerulus, moves into the nephron, and it is reabsorbed. So what would that look like? The first part would still be the same until we get to the glomerulus. If it's filtered, it goes into Bowman's capsule, now it's filtrate into the PCT, and if it was reabsorbed from the PCT, it goes into the paratubular capillaries. If it was reabsorbed at the loop of Henle, it could go into the paratubular capillaries or the vasorecta, so it just depends on where it was reabsorbed. Once it's in the paratubular capillaries, ultimately it gets back to the vena cava. The third option would have been, and this is the one that I always use on my exam, so this is the one you would have expected to see, path of blood if it is filtered and not reabsorbed. So I would have worded it as trace the path of the crop of blood from some point to the kidney where it is filtered and not reabsorbed, ending in the toilet. So we would go from the aorta until we get to the glomerulus. It's filtered into Bowman's capsule. Now we're in the nephron. PCT, descending limb of the loop of Henle, ascending limb of the loop of Henle, DCT, collecting duct. Now we leave the nephron. We're in just the kidney itself, the minor calyx, the major calyx, the renal pelvis. We leave the kidney into the ureter, ultimately to the urinary bladder, leaving through the urethra and ending in the toilet. So that's what would have been the path of blood on this exam. That is it for the urinary system. The next two lectures tend to be ones that students enjoy the most because it's a little bit easier after everything that we've just done. Um, I've had a few questions about the, the uh, ABG worksheet, quiz, whatever you want to call it. That will be what we do over the next two lectures. So if you looked at it and it's just, you know, I have no idea what I'm looking at, that's because we haven't done it yet. We will be doing it in the next two lectures. So keep that handy and we will end up doing that together next class, at least partially. All right, take care and please email me questions. Please email me suggestions, anything that you guys need. Take care.